to call this meeting to order. As a reminder, please note that panel meetings are now being live streamed over the internet for the convenience of those unable to attend, and a recording and transcript will be posted to the panel website following this meeting. Also, please note that if you signed up for public comment regarding an issue pertaining to your school's personnel, we will ask that you speak with one of the staff members in the audience. Um, they'll be able to discuss the matter with you, take down specific information for follow-up. So thank you in advance for your cooperation. Mr. Secretary, can you please call the roll? Peter Calantrella. Present. Isaac Carmignani. Present. Janielle Chacon. Present. April Chapman. Present. Jose Devia. Present. Deborah Dillingham. Present. Michael Kraft. Present. Vanessa Leung. Here. Gary Lennon. Lori Pavesker. Here. Shannon White. Here. Miguelina Zuri Aristi. Present. Can we now have everybody on the stage introduce themselves, please? Charlotte Amamjian, Executive Director, Contracts and Purchasing. Lindsay Oates, Chief Financial Officer. Deborah Dillingham, Queensboro Pointy. Peter Calandrella, Staten Island Borough Pointy. Isaac Carmignani, Mayoral Pointy. Shannon Waite, Mayoral Pointy. Jose Davila, Mayoral Pointy. Edie Sharp, Chief of Staff. Richard Garranza, Chancellor. Howard Friedman, General Counsel. Vanessa Leung, Mayoral Appointee. Lori Padvesker, Mayoral Appointee. Shania Chacon, Bronx Borough Appointee. Miguelina Sorrilla-Risti, Mayoral Appointee. Michael Kraft, Manhattan Borough Appointee. April Chapman, Brooklyn Borough Appointee. Right, thank you, everyone. Thank you, Mr. Secretary. So the first order of business this evening will be approving the minutes. <laughs> exciting minutes can be um, from the June 20th 2018 panel meeting that was very nice um, so is there a motion to approve the minutes from the June 20th 2018 panel meeting thank you panel member Podvesker is there a second second thank you panel, panel member Dillingham uh, please raise your hand if you vote to approve the minutes Ten, um, please raise your hand. You do not approve the minutes. Um, any abstentions? And one. Thank you. So, good evening, Chancellor Carranza. Would you like to share any thoughts with us this evening? Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, I would like to share a few thoughts, mm -hmm. uh, and I want to welcome everyone to this meeting as well. <clears throat> Just a couple of thoughts as we start this evening. Um, I wanted to let me get my notes. I uh, wanted to uh, speak just a bit about uh, the incredible time that I've had uh, the last two days uh, visiting Staten Island, and I want to thank Peter Calandrella for uh, keeping that island so well attuned to student needs. Uh, but we've had a great time. As you know, the mayor is visiting uh, the, the mayor's office in the borough, so we spent time at Staten Island. I enjoyed connecting with families and residents at the resource fair recently. What an incredibly engaged uh, borough Staten Island is. Um, I was also incredibly uh, impressed visiting Wagner High School where I saw the new uh, arts facility, was able to see students that were participating in the Summer Arts Academy. Uh, and this is significant for Staten Island because students often had to leave the borough mm -hmm. uh, to attend prestigious visual, visual arts and other programs over the summer. Uh, so they are now there in their borough, and I, I need to tell you, various groups that I saw, uh, there were students not just from Wagner High School, but from all schools across the borough, so it was good to see. Uh, I want to remind everyone that summer school is in full swing. Uh, we're proud of our recent announcements that help us address the summer melt, including the free books to all 3K and pre-K families. Uh, parents of youngsters also have access to over 6,000 titles through Myon Digital Library, and all this information is available online, uh, and those titles are also in English and Spanish. Uh, summer meals, uh, just a reminder that we have free summer meals to, for anyone under 18 years of age at, at our summer sites. And also regarding summer school, this is the last couple of weeks of summer enrichment programs. Uh, they will end August 9th for elementary and middle schools and August 15th uh, for high schools. 
speaking of ending the summer, we are in full gear up for the first day of school. Mm -hmm. uh, and I'm very excited. And if you haven't had a chance, I hope you'll take the opportunity to explore the recently announced new and super accessible and parent friendly website. Um, we are laser focused on making sure that parents have access to information and that it's readily accessible in multiple languages. Uh, we're also laser focused on getting our schools ready uh, and a first day uh, of school by the numbers. This is what we're preparing for. Uh, over 1,800 schools will be open and ready to go. 1,350 buildings, which is 130 million square feet, will be cleaned and prepped to welcome our students. Over 600,000 Metro cards delivered to families, 9,000 buses ready to pick up our students, and over a million meals prepare, prepared uh, to be served on that day. So it's a huge undertaking, but we're uh, in full preparation mode for that. Um, I also want to just take a minute to share um, mm -hmm. uh, something that's very concerning to me and I think should be concerning to all of us. Uh, as a chancellor, I wear many, many hats, and today I'm going to speak as a parent. Uh, there is no greater concern than for children's safety, and I can assure you that it remains at the forefront of everything we do in our schools. Uh, today, <clears throat> uh, approximately 45 minutes ago, uh, 120 speed cameras in school zones went dark. It wasn't because of a funding issue. It wasn't because of a technology issue. <clears throat> it was unfortunately because the Senate in the state of New York would not reauthorize those speed cameras. We have data to show that they have saved lives. We have data to show that incidences that of vehicular crimes have gone down. Uh, and I am, again, begging the Senate mm -hmm. to still come back and do right and reauthorize those speed cameras. Uh, just because it's summer, it does not mean that our buildings are empty. As I mentioned, we have students in summer school. Uh, our schools are open all summer for school programs, and our students must be safe as they travel to and from school. I've heard stories of students that have been lost due to reckless driving. I've heard stu stories of adults that have been hurt and maimed because of vehicular issues. Uh, this is a no-nonsense, very simple solution that is statistically showing results. Our speed cameras are a common sense solution. So this failure to act is a disservice to our students and our families. And I'm going to ask that if uh, any of us have the ability to write to our senators, to send a letter, to make a phone call, please encourage our senators to come back uh, and re- how can I put this gently? Do your job, protect students. And I don't want this summer to go by and to have on anyone's conscience a failure to act that leads to an unfortunate tragedy for any of our students. With that, Madam Chair, I turn the, the time back over to you. Thank you, Chancellor. So before we get underway with the voting portion of the meeting, I'll say a few words about public comment and rules of decorum at this meeting. So during the public comment period, speakers will be permitted up to two minutes to comment. I will ask the secretary to call the speakers up from the sign-up sheets and to ensure that speakers finish their comments in the allotted time. So we'll call up speakers up in groups of five. And if you have a green ticket, um, you'll proceed to the aisle on my far right. Um, once your number is called, and if you have a yellow ticket, you'll proceed to the aisle to my far left once your number is called. And, and the clock will indicate the amount of time remaining for each speaker, and a light will indicate when there is one minute left in the allotted time so that speakers will know when their time is up. And at the conclusion of each speaker's time, we will move on to the next speaker. And if a speaker is not here when his or her name is called, we will move on to the next speaker. And once we move on, you cannot redeem your place in the queue. So the next, uh, the next voting item on the agenda tonight is the consideration of contracts. I will now ask that contracts committee member Isaac Carmignani summarize for the panel the contract committee's recommendations regarding the contracts listed on tonight's agenda. Thank you, Thank you Chair Leung. The contracts committee met on Monday, July 23rd, 2018, and reviewed the contracts being considered by the panel tonight. I met with contracts committee members Jose Davila, Janil Chacon, Gary Lennon, April Chapman, and Peter Calandrella. At the meeting, the committee unanimously recommended the approval of contract items 1 through 25. 
The Contracts Committee recommends that contract items 1 to 25 be considered in five resolutions. Resolution 1, which are RFPs, items 1 and 2. Resolution 2, which are multiple task and listing items, items 3 through 10 and 19 and 20. Resolution 3, which are competitive seal bid and negotiated service contracts, items 11 through 15. Resolution 4, which are amendments and extensions, items 16 through 18. And Resolution 5, other funding sources such as discretionary, 21 through 25. Thank you, Panel Member Kamihani. Uh, before we begin, Executive Director of Contracts and Purchasing, Ms. Hamamjian, do you have any text you'd like to read into the minutes? Thank you. Changes to contracts that have been approved by the panel at prior meetings. The technical changes have been posted to the web. Okay, thank you, Ms. Hamamjian. Uh, Mr. Secretary, please present the five resolutions recommended by the Contracts Committee. The resolutions are all entitled the resolution regarding approval of contracts and is indicated by panel member Carmignani. The first resolution contains contract items one and two. The second resolution contains contract items 3 through 10, 19, and 20. The third resolution contains contract items 11 through 15. The fourth resolution contains contract items 16 through 18. And the fifth resolution contains contract items 21 through 25. Panel members, please note that if you wish to vote differently for a specific contract item within a single resolution, you may do so. Simply signal to me when the vote is called for the relevant resolution and indicate the item number within that resolution and your corresponding vote. Thank you, Mr. Secretary. Is there a motion to adopt the five resolutions regarding approval of contracts? Thank you, Panel Member Podbesker. Is there a second? Thank you, Panel Member Calandrella. Um, are there comments? There, there's public comment on contracts, but we also have students here today. And so I'd like to call the students first. It's Tanya Santos. Chancellor, please come to our school to count after school starts to count the students and see how overcrowded it is. Because for me as an SIT, as an ICT student, mm -hmm. it's very hard to learn. And the teachers don't have any places to go to tutor students. We lost five classrooms and it's very hard. That's it. Thank you. Thank you. It's Tabitha Kavanaugh. Hello, my name is Tabitha. I was a former student of 292. Um, I go to LaGuardia High School now, um, so art is a huge part of my life. I do it like every single day, and I'm seriously considering art as a career, but I would not have known of that LaGuardia was even a thing if I hadn't taken the art classes at 292. My teacher, she worked with us every single week. Um, she not only encouraged me to improve my art, but she's the one who suggested that I go to LaGuardia and she worked with us individually to build our portfolios. Mm. And without her, I wouldn't have even gotten in. Without, like, without the space, it, it'll take away those programs that allowed me to get into a specialized high school. So I would just like to ask the chancellor to come to the school and do an official student count for both schools before the school year begins. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. We have... Um public comment on contracts. The first person is Ken Fisher. Ken Fisher, attorney for Higher School, a current vendor of services to non-public schools whose contract is not before you tonight because of a contrived non-responsiveness determination 
and we request that item number nine with respect to those specific two contracts be tabled until our protest is resolved. Your briefing materials don't include this, but there was an initial determination that higher school was non-responsive in a proposal it submitted in February because two tables didn't match. For five months, we tried to find out what the status was, and it was only uh, just a couple of weeks ago that we received a, uh, a letter uh, saying that it was because these tables didn't match. We immediately filed a protest. And an hour after we filed the protest, we got a new letter from DOE saying, well, actually, the tables did match, but your proposal is still not responsive because the price went up a small amount um, from an earlier version that had been submitted in, uh, in January. That is not only uh, not based on any provision of your rules or uh, the RFP, but in fact, your rules and the RFP both contemplate that there would be a give and take, a back and forth, collaboration, an iterative process uh, before a final determination was made. We haven't had that opportunity. So we ask you to please hold off until our protest, which has now been submitted on the second determination, is issued. There won't be any prejudice to the DOE, the students, the uh, schools, the other vendors. All of the contracts actually run until 2019. But there will be prejudice to higher school, there will be prejudice to the 200 instructors who don't know if they have jobs in September, and to the students with whom they have built a relationship. Please table item nine. Thank you. I have copies of my testimony to hand up and I'm prepared to provide backup material at your request. Ms. Samaji, which? Under consideration. David Irving. Yeah, I'm sorry. Uh, based on the, the status of, of, of the protest, how would that affect any outcome of a vote this evening? The solicitation uh, pursuant to which the awards uh, in RA number nine are being presented are pursuant to an MTAC, which is an open-ended RFP. Proposers have continued opportunities to submit, and therefore there are other proposers whose awards might be presented at future panel meetings, and as such, the moving forward with the subject to awards does not prejudice or affect the pending protest. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. David Irving. Yes, good evening. My name is David Irving, and I'm the founder of the chief executive of Higher School Instructional Services. I spent 16 years building effective and successful instructional programs in seven major school districts, yet we're not on tonight's docket. For the past nine years, higher school has been the second largest provider of instructional services in this program, with over 7,000 students annually being serviced. Yet, we're not on this program in the, today's docket. We are arguably the most effective instructional program in Title I, yet we are not on the docket. Instructors who join us from other firms have said we provide the most comprehensive professional development training Yet, we are not on tonight's docket. Only on July 6th were we informed by DOE staff that our pricing and budget did not match and that our proposal was deemed non-responsive. I had spent the last five months writing and calling, asking them to tell me if they needed additional information and then to explain how they could say that the appendices in question did not match when they clearly did match. It was not until immediately after our protest that we received a response stating our appendices did in fact match, which we believe means our proposal was responsive and should be on tonight's docket. I don't generally make it a point to mention that we are the only African American firm in this program because frankly our success speaks for itself. And to the schools, the parents and students that we serve, that is what truly matters. When we are denied the same consideration given to other firms who lack the stellar reputa reputation that higher school has worked so hard to achieve, you have to wonder why. I was told many years ago by a principal in the Mississippi Delta to first ask myself what is in the best interest of the children that we serve before making decisions that would affect them. I ask you to do the same thing. Table your vote until higher school has been given the same consideration as the other vendors before you. 
Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Isaac Greenfield. Uh, I'm sorry, hold on one second. Can we ask what, where was nine. this on the agenda? It's it's agenda nine. item number nine. Can we, the same item. Nine? Can we ask a question? Yeah. If, was this denied or was this postponed um, the, as this gentleman is speaking? What is the status of this? The most recent protest was just received and is under consideration by a protest officer. Okay, so I guess the same question is, is the first. Not voting on this tonight, would that impact, uh, make a major impact tonight on what we are voting on? Or could this come up next month if you, if you come to a resolution? So pending a resolution on the protest submitted by higher schools, and depending on the outcome of it, we can always bring an award to higher schools or any responsive, responsible vendor at a future panel meeting, including potentially one next month. Okay, they, so are, I, they are I, independently evaluated and making an award um, and approving awards tonight does not preclude or have any impact yes. on the determination for the pending protest. So I, I do have a question because this is the second vendor that has mentioned this exact same process about um, receiving something it's the same. like for months it's trying to get information and then receiving something with a short turnaround indicating that they were non-responsive and then receiving information saying they were in fact responsive. So unless I'm misunderstanding what both of these gentlemen said. So I believe they actually are speaking on behalf of the same entity. One is the attorney representing oh. the vendor and one is the actual entity. Okay. In both instances, the vendor was notified that they were non-responsive. There was an indication in the first, as I believe um, the attorney first indicated, that tables did not match, but the non-responsive item that is under consideration by the protest officer is in regards to a discrepancy on the amount having submitted an increased amount. That's what the subject okay. is. It's only one item. Could I say one more thing? Uh, our, our no, big, sir. I'm sorry? Yeah, our, our big concern oh. is that the funds that are being voted on tonight for this Title I program have already been allocated to two firms. And if we are approved next month or whatever else, uh, and these firms are approved tonight, there will be no funding left for our program. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Isaac Greenfield. I'd like to know. Oh, well, I'm, it, I'm sorry. sorry, sir. So, uh, so the funding that is being used to um, for the award of this pending two awards does not impact the funding that remains for future awards. As I indicated, it's an open-ended RFP. Solicitations and proposals are still being reviewed and funding exists for future. And in fact, it is anticipated that we will bring additional awards to future panel. Mr. Greenfield. <laughs> Good evening. I've been a supervisor for the same company, Higher School, for many years. Um, I was just asked to come down here, so I just wanted to mention I've, I've gotten fabulous feedback throughout the years. I don't work for, for Higher School fully, and you know whether this contract happens or not, I'll find something else to do. But I want to say one thing about Higher School, and that is the nicest timer's not on. <laughs> the, uh, the, the most beautiful comment that I've ever got was from the, in a Hasidic school where they have uh, limited secular studies. They, they study a lot of, of Judaic studies and this gentleman came over to me, one PTA, I'll never forget this, and he says to me, let me tell you why you guys are so amazing. My, my kid comes home every night and he's starting to read English. It's so beautiful. And I just want to tell you guys one thing. You guys are so amazing that I, I wish you were here when I went to school. I'll never forget that ever. And I just want to say something about a higher school, about David and Miriam and, and the executives in higher school. These, these guys have one thing in mind, and that's the students. I'm not just saying that. I know it because I walk into the schools, I speak to the principals, I speak to the students, and these students are not just happy, they're thrilled with Title I. They're running to Title I with higher school. This is taking years of collaboration between the principals, the teachers, and it just behooves me what's going on here tonight. Higher school has been around for quite a while. It's taken a tremendous amount of investment, not just time, energy,
But I want to tell you something about David, and that is he was never short on budget. If I'd come to him and say to him, we need better books, we need better teachers, we need better PD, he'd say, yes, just go out and get it. Don't worry about the money. And I'm saying this from my heart tonight for everybody to understand. It. It just, it's just so perplexing what's going on. The bottom line is, is that if these contracts are awarded to these two other vendors, we're having a problem recruiting teachers because I'm involved in that. The teachers are telling me, are you guys on for next year? Because I want to work for the other company. So this has a major impact here tonight for us hiring teachers, for them uh, solicitating other, other schools. It's not just, well, we'll just wait and see what happens. There's a tremendous impact for all the schools that we have tirelessly worked for years to collaborate and work with. And the bottom line as far as higher school has always been has been the students. I'm just saying this and vouching on behalf of David Irving, Miriam Friedman, and all the people that I've worked for. Thank you so much. Have a great evening. Thank, Thank you. you. Um, Oh, yes. Panama Michigan. I have a question. Um, you said they, they are under consideration. Um, what's the time frame for that? Because we know we have one month until school reopens, and most after school programs, like all these programs, start, let's say, October, November, right? Um, what is the time frame? Because we, we want to make sure that that's said. And it's a timely time frame. <laughs> um, protest determinations happen within two weeks of the submitted protest. I believe we just received the, the most recent protest this past week. So we expect to be able to submit a determination no later than two weeks from the date that it was submitted. So then, just for knowledge, um, the next panel meeting, for the record, that we can, they can bring their um, concerns back to the table at our next meeting to be considered for this specific item. Depending on the determination of the protest. Okay. Thank you. It's a panel members have any other questions or comments regarding tonight's contracts? I, I yes. Panel member Zerilla Aristi. You mentioned that this is um, an ongoing RFP. How many of these contracts are awarded under this budget? Because I know they mentioned two other vendors. So this is actually the first request for authorization that's being presented to this panel. It includes two vendors. As I indicated before, we expect to be bringing forth additional awardees at future panel members. Other panel members, yes, panel member Calandrella. Would delaying the, uh, ma the consideration of the matter, essentially tabling uh, this particular item, adversely affect what's going, uh, w what would be intended to go forward at, the, at this time with regards to the other vendors? That's what, that's what I'm trying to grasp a hold of. So the Moving forward, the subject to awards and the protest determination that's pending are mutually exclusive. Um, neither one affects the other. So being able to move forward with these two, understanding that funding um, that's allocated for these two does not mean that we don't have funding for future awards is important to note. Um, similarly, the pending uh, determination is not affected by the ability to move forward with these two. So, yeah, panel member Dillingham. Correct me if I'm, I'm wrong, but I think the real question is on scheduling. Yeah. So we approve or don't mm -hmm. approve this evening. What is the timeline that we're working for implementation and how would that affect a decision made in August? Would they, would both proposals either made tonight or in August have the same implementation schedule, and could we start at the beginning of September? Um, What's that? Not, not, yes. knowing the, <laughs> not knowing the programming details of the <coughs> office that oversees um, the contracts, it would be difficult for me to indicate um, what the impact of not moving forward with the two pending requests for authorizations are. I can just indicate that moving forward with them absolutely does not prejudice the protest that is under consideration and the potential to bring it or any other awards to the panel in the future. Can I, just for clarification, 
the current contracts are still in place through June of 2019. So these contracts are starting for the next fiscal year, or yes, for no, June 2020. So uh, no, I should clarify, as the item indicates, okay. um, there are existing contracts that are in place through June 30th of 2019. 19. These two awards that were might be approved here tonight would mm -hmm. start this coming school year. This will start this coming school year. But the current, my understanding is higher learning currently has their contract until June 2019, June is that what they're saying? That's what, under contract, as both vendors and higher school are currently under contract to June 30th, 2019. Mm -hmm. Is that correct? I, I'm <laughs> reading off the test. It's yeah, the no, test I, I, I was correct. waiting your answer. Yes, I believe based on the testimony, the current the vendor's contract is um, valid until June 30th, 2019. These two new awards would commence the start of this school year. Yes, panel member Chapman. So just, hi. Um, so when the gentleman came up and spoke about the issue, they mentioned that when they first sent it in, there maybe was some error about the two tables matching, and then shortly after that, they had a sort of extension. So that, that was sort of a long timeline. Um, will they be able to get some sort of uh, response, you said within like two weeks, but they've, it sounds like they've been waiting for a while because of, I'm not sure what happened with the table being looked at it, being told that it wasn't the same. And so it's a little concerning that they may be penalized and not be able to hire teachers and do things in time for the school year. So those are some of the merits that will be reviewed as part of the protest determination. Can I, can I clarify something? Uh, hi, this contract that you're voting on tonight is different than the one we currently have. There are two additional components, tutoring and mentoring. Right. We will not be able to provide those services, so schools will most likely choose a vendor that can provide them. And we can lose the schools right. that we currently have. And second thing is that this contract, I believe is for uh, $40 million a year, 34 million have been allocated to one vendor, 6 million to another. So there's no additional money in my understanding for any additional vendors. And I've been in this program for nine years. And not on one single, not one time have I ever seen a vendor be approved after the initial approval. Not one <laughs> vendor has ever been added Thank in this program. Thank you. Thank you. Just to clarify, we usually don't have a back and forth, and this is a panel I'm discussion. Sorry. I That's apologize. okay. Um, yes. Is there any other questions? concerns at this point. Panel, panel member Chacon. So considering everything that we heard tonight, um, person, well, personally, I would want to get more information um, about, especially the con under con consideration of the, the program, and I want to make a motion to table um, agenda nine. I second. All right. So we'll take a vote to table item number nine, contract item number nine. Um, please raise your hand if you vote to approve tabling item, contract item number nine. Nine. Motion carries. Ten. I don't know. Okay, never mind. Those. Okay, it's tabled. Yeah. Motion carries. Item agenda item nine is tabled. All right. Are there are any other questions or comments regarding any other contracts this evening. Yeah. Panel member, wait. Is this the time where we can recruit? Well, no. We'll go over that. Yes. Okay. Are there any other questions or comments? So we'll move 
We'll move now. Thank you, everybody. So we'll move now to vote on the resolution. So, Mr. Secretary, could you please note any recusals related to these contract items? Yeah, Member Waite wait is uh, recused on items 10 and 13. 10 and 13. Thank you, Mr. Secretary. Uh, so please raise your hand if you vote to approve the resolution regarding the approval of contract items 1 and 2. Ten. Motion carries. Um, all those opposed? We only have Can you raise your hands again? Sorry. Eleven. Eleven. That's unanimous. Um, next, please raise your hand if you vote to approve the resolution regarding the approval of contracts three through eight. Just going to do it separately. Three through eight. Um, nine has been tabled, and I'm going to do separately item number ten. Please raise your hand. Do you vote to approve item number ten? That's ten and one recusal. Panel member, wait. And then items 19 and 20. That's 11. That's unanimous. Motion carries. Thank you. Next, please, your, please raise your hand if you vote to approve the resolution regarding the approval of contract items 11, 11 and 12, 14 and 15. 11, that's unanimous. Please raise your hand if you vote to approve item number 13. 10, and there's one recusal. Panel member, wait. Thank you. Uh, next, please raise your hand if you vote to approve the resolution regarding the approval of contract items 16 through 18. 11. That's unanimous. Thank you. Next, please raise your hand if you vote to approve the resolution regarding the approval of contract items 21 through 25. 11. That's unanimous. Thank you. So that concludes the voting portion of the meeting. So we'll now accept general public comment. Again, during public comment period, speakers will be permitted up to two minutes. I'll ask the secretary to call the speakers up from the sign-up sheets um, in groups of five. If you have a green ticket, please proceed to the aisle on my far right. If you have a yellow ticket, my left, um, and the clock, the clock will indicate your time. Um, again, a light will indicate when there's one minute left, so you know when to conclude your remarks. And at the conclusion, we'll move on to the next speaker. Okay, if um, numbers one through five, yellow and green, can come down. And the first person is Oral Brady. Good afternoon, Mr. Chancellor, panel board members. I'm speaking here today on behalf of IS-292, one of the few schools that have had the distinction of welcoming the chancellor twice in his very short stay so far here in New York City. Last time was on the 16th of June where the Chancellor and the Mayor made that announcement about the changes in the application for specialized high schools, something that was well overdue. However, Mr. Chancellor, we do need your help. We're one of the few public schools who have consistently sent children to specialized high school in 2015, 2016, we sent seven. 16, 17, we sent nine. And this year, we sent 11, all to specialized high school. In one case, students were accepted to both Stuyvesant and Bard. So I do believe the school is doing really well. However, Mr. Chancellor, the school space has been dwindling significantly over the last three years. We moved from four floors to three floors and now we're down to one single floor, which is the second floor. And fortunately, I'm not here to badmouth the charter schools because they have a very important role to play, but I don't believe that there has been any kind of fairness in the projections that were made for the number of students they were expecting and the allocation of the space for our students for this year. As a union leader in my building, 
I filed the grievances last year for oversized classrooms, and I know I'll have to do it again this year on even a larger scale. We're asking, Mr. Chancellor, please, if this body could just review some of those decisions that were made before you came to town, because it's really a disservice to public school and public school education when no one stands up for us. We're hoping you will make that difference. Thank you. Thank you. Isabel Santos. Good evening, Chancellor. I am Tanya Santos' mother, Isabel Santos. I am the PTA member board of Junior High School 292. I have seen the classes overcrowded due to helping the charter schools, because we have three schools in our school, not two. And it's the charter schools is taking over to the point, how is my child supposed to learn properly, especially in the ICT class when there's 30 students? Because all the classes is 35 to 37 students because we're giving our classes to the charter schools. So what am I supposed to do with my child as a parent? Then I go pick up my child. Oh, we are on lockdown because there was a bomb threat to charter school. We're stuck with that. And it's not fair. It's not fair that the charter schools is getting everything when a class of charter school has 12 to 16 students. And we're stuck with 35 to 37 students. How is my child learning? How is any of our children learning? It's not fair. But if you could please come to the school during school hours and do a head count between public school and the charter schools and tell me who needs more classes. Is it them or is it us? Because it's not fair. That's my child. She's an ICT. I have another child also with, needs ICT, autistic. How are they going to learn with so many students in their classroom? It's not fair. So if you could please come to our school once again, you're more than welcome. We praise you all the time. Love that. Um, but if you could please come and just come to our school, see how we work. We've had to do so many scannings because charter schools is bringing weapons to our school for our kids, this is not fair. And I'm there all day, every day. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Sh Sharon Montrose. Dear Chancellor, it's a pleasure to meet you. I would like to share this story of a teacher from IS-292. This teacher could not have attended this meeting today. This teacher had a student that was struggling. He did not meet the, meet the, he did not meet the requirement for the ELA this year. With this teacher tutoring the student in her classroom, when this <laughs> okay, this teacher to the, the student in her class, which is a class that is being consolidated. This teacher used her classroom to to the student during her prep and lunch. Therefore, the students were able to meet the 2008 ELA exam requirement. If the charter school takes over, the students would not be able to, would not have the opportunity to pass the state exam. <clears throat> Chancellor, come back to the school and do an official student count for both schools before the school year. Thank you. Thank you. Michael Pierce. Good job, Sharon. She was very nervous. Um, <laughs> good evening. Uh, Mr. Chancellor, I would like to reiterate and restate my colleague's request for you to come to the school before the end of the uh, summer and to do an official count for both schools. Uh, my name is Michael Pierce. I am the restorative justice coordinator uh, at the school. We just started this program this year, and it's been very effective. Um, when I started in September, what the first thing that I caught my eye was how much classes and, and, and uh, activities were happening in the hallways. Uh, and so I asked uh, uh, Principal Edwards, you know, why 
there was so much happening in the hallways, and he basically said there was a space issue because of the, the different, uh, the, the fact that we're sharing space amongst uh, the three different schools. And I understand that that's, that's something that happens in multiple buildings uh, in this city. However, it's, um, there's a couple of things. There's one, how they go about, uh, how we go about sharing the space. Um, it was kind of done sort of like a thief in the night kind of thing. Um, and there was no consideration, there was no sit down, there was no negotiation. Um, secondly, also uh, with me being restorative justice uh, uh, coordinator and counselor, I deal with uh, a lot of the social, emotional issues that our students have. We have a third of our student population uh, that are part of displaced families who live in shelters or, or uh, you know, other alternatives. And I speak to some of these children about, uh, you know, their situation and how they feel. Um, and if they, when they come to school, do they feel a little bit better? Does it feel like a home away from home? And some of them say no, because they don't feel like they have any ownership because of their classrooms. The class sizes is too, are, too, are too large, and so a lot of times they're having class in the hallway or having class in the auditorium. So they tell me, you know what, I feel the same way I do when I'm in the shelter, like I don't have a place to call my, my own. Um, and so again, we just like to, again, restate the request for you to come to the school, take a look, maybe help us out with the situation. And again, it's all about the kids and, and the students' education. So thank you very much. Thank you, Naftuli Moster. Hi, good evening. My name is Naftali Moster, and I'm the founder and executive director of YAFED, Young Advocates for Fair Education. Three years ago, we submitted a complaint signed by 52 yeshiva graduates to the previous chancellor and seven district superintendents, alleging that many Hasidic yeshivas, particularly the boys' schools, provide little or no secular education. On average, Hasidic boys in elementary and middle school only receive 90 minutes of secular education at the end of the day and only in English and math. In high school, most Hasidic boys receive no secular education at all. I repeat, none. Instead, they spend 12 to 14 hours a day in yeshiva studying exclusively Judaic studies. No English, no math, no science, no social studies, nothing. The investigation, which will officially turn three years old this Saturday, has been nothing but a sham. As of last September, two years into the investigation, the city only visited six yeshivas of the 39 they were supposed to. And as of today, the city still only visited 15 of them, apparently the 15 who allowed the inspectors in. What kind of investigation is that? It appears to be guided by political considerations, not concern for the children. A year ago, Mr. Howard Friedman promised an interim report, but has not produced it. This after his predecessor promised a full report back in the spring of 2016. This stalling and stonewalling is inexcusable and unacceptable. Every year, every passing year, thousands more children enter this system and continue to be denied a basic education and robbed of a future. Mr. Carranza, I want to welcome you to the city and express my sympathy that this has fallen on you, an investigation you're supposed to oversee, but one that is heavily controlled by a mayor who plays politics with children's rights. But please don't let him corrupt you the way he has your former, the former Chancellor Karine, uh, Farina or the current General Counsel Friedman. Get to the bottom of what is happening and ensure that every child gets the education he or she deserves. And I would also like to take this opportunity to request an in-person meeting. Thank you. Have a good night. Thank you. Thank you. Jacob Aronson. Good evening. My name is Jacob Aronson, and I'm also here uh, because of the city's failure to address the lack of secular education in many ultra-Orthodox yeshivas. This issue is important to me because I myself grew up Orthodox and I attended an Orthodox yeshiva in New York City for 13 years. Fortunately for me, the yeshiva that I went to was different. I was not in any way deprived of a secular education. At my school, we were taught the Bible in the original Hebrew and the Talmud in the original Aramaic but we were also taught things like math, science, and history with the same enthusiasm. Unfortunately, that's not the norm in New York's Hasidic community, but it is possible, as I know not only from my school, but also from the fact that many Hasidic girls, girls schools do teach secular subjects in a serious way. I, of course, do not question the right of yeshivas to exist and to teach religious studies. I certainly do not object to the rights of parents to send their children to a yeshiva, or any other school for that matter. Those types of concerns are too often brought up as a means of distraction to divert attention from the issue at hand that is an issue of elementary justice. There is no right to deny children an education in things like science, English, history, and geography. After listening to the stories of yeshiva graduates who didn't know what an essay was or what, a, what an atom was, I felt compelled to speak out. 
My school taught me how to read, write, and speak in English, and that's the reason I'm able to stand in front of you today and speak out on behalf of tens of thousands of students who barely learn any English and who don't have the ability to come and speak out and defend themselves. The fact that the city has done pretty much nothing about this is morally contemptible. Spending three years on an investigation with no results is an outrage. Why is it taking so long to produce a report? More and more people are waking up to this injustice and we won't put up with it. All we want is a proper education for students who are entitled to it. Thank you. Thank you. Lucas Chasen. Good evening. My name is Lucas Chasen. I was born and raised in Manhattan, and I was lucky enough to attend some of the best public schools in this country. Because of this, I have always taken my education for granted. I assumed that every other New Yorker had the same opportunities. After all, it only makes sense that such a prosperous city should ensure the best education for its residents, right? Then I learned about the tens of thousands of ultra-Orthodox Jewish children who are unwittingly being denied their right to a quality secular education in yeshivas around the city. These schools do not meet the curriculum standards of every other public and private school in the city, and yet they are funded in part by our own taxpayer money. The city government has been investigating this issue for the past three years, but none of this administration's promises have ever been kept. When one considers the fact that the ultra-Orthodox community is our fastest growing demographic, the silent crisis that our city faces becomes clearer. I'd like everyone here to ask themselves, how do you expect New York City to remain a global financial hub in the coming decades if our fastest growing community does not even receive the most basic general education? Do you think there will be long-term economic consequences to this neglect? Ask yourself how that will in turn affect the lives of you and your children. This is far more important than some people seem to realize. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Chaim Nikolovic. Hi, good evening. My name is Chaim Mishalovin, and I attended a Hasidic yeshiva boarding school in New York until I was 17 years old. Our uh, daily schedule was from 8.30 a.m. to 8 p.m., and during that time we studied Bible, Talmudic, Talmudic critical thinking, Talmudic stories, uh, Hasidic philosophy, and more Bible. Um, we never learned any math, science, social studies, English literature, or any other secular education, no physical ed. We were not provided any guidance towards receiving a higher education or any direction in what to, where to go after we graduated yeshiva, if we can even call it graduation. In fact, we were actively discouraged. In my personal attempts to seek a secular education, I actually received a fine when they found a Algebra for Dummies book under my bed in the boarding school. Mm. The teachers held no degrees, they had no experience teaching, and they had no, they, they weren't capable of dealing with rowdy children or, or uh, regulating a classroom properly, and it inhibited the ability for children to receive any education, let alone a secular education. After leaving high school, I had to fend for myself, figuring out how to get, gain a college education. I had to go through the GD program by myself, mm. and it was, probably the most difficult thing that I ever had to do. The No Child Left Behind Act passed Congress in 2015. The Every Child Succeeds Act passed in 2015. It's now 2018, and I implore of you to please stop inhibiting the success of yeshiva students and stop ignoring the yeshiva children left behind. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Jason Goldberg. Panel members. I am Jason Goldberg, and I would like to present a unique perspective as to why I think the city needs to do a better job of ensuring that ultra-Orthodox Jews get an adequate education. I did not grow up an Orthodox Jew. I received a secular education at a public school. I was attracted uh, to traditional Judaism by the intellectual rigor of the Talmud, a famous piece of Jewish literature where Jewish legalistic concepts are discussed and debated but I was also attracted by the 12th century rabbi, Maimonides, who has a hospital that bears his name only a few blocks away, who was a doctor to the Sultan in Egypt, 
was a prolific philosopher and wrote one of, the, one of his seminal works in Jewish philosophy in, in the language that was spoken by the surrounding society. And I would like to note that there are many ultra-Orthodox Jews who cannot even speak the language of the surrounding society. While he was extremely influential in the Jewish world, he also had an incredible impact on the secular world. Without a figure like Maimonides, the Jewish world would be lacking, but the secular world would be lacking as well. I believe ultra-Orthodox Jews, com Jew Jewish communities possess tons of Maimonideses. People who possess an incredible ability, not just to make contributions to the Jewish world, but to the secular world as well. By not giving ultra-Orthodox Jews the secular and Jewish education they need to thrive in our modern society, the city is missing out on tons of doctors, lawyers, accountants, computer programmers, and prof professors that will propel our society and invigorate our economy. When the city fails to provide an adequate education to the ultra-Orthodox, the city fails not just the ultra-Orthodox, but the citizens of New York City who desperately need the high-skilled workers that a proper secular education for ultra-Orthodox Jews would produce. It is a responsibility of the city to ensure that all children's, our children are able to function in our society. And every minute the city doesn't provide an education to an ultra-Orthodox ultra Jew, the city fails in its duty. Thank you. Thank you. Hi, Chancellor. About 20 years ago, I attended a Sirik Yeshiva High School in Brooklyn. I spent 13 to 14 hours per day in school. I had extensive education in Judaic studies, but was never offered a secular or English education, and therefore never received a high school degree. The Yeshiva I attended for three years still exists and still does not offer any English or secular education in their curriculum. I was fortunate that our family communicated in English at home, unlike my classmates who spoke mostly Yiddish. My classmates in high school were not able to properly communicate in English, and as far as I know, none of them went on to college, and many of them today rely on public aid. I'm saddened and disappointed that the yeshiva investigation by the education department has gone nowhere. I'm kind of stunned by the apparent lack of concern by the mayor and other education officials over the worsening state of education in Hasidic schools, especially given the rapid growth of the Hasidic community mm -hmm. and potential future economic and social crisis. I'm sure that everyone in here tonight will agree that better education, just like better health care, benefits society as a whole. Mm -hmm. I'd also like to point out that we are not self-appointed critics or disgruntled individuals, as some would like to call us. Most of us are former yeshiva students who were left extremely lacking in education. Most of us have worked hard to make up for our deficiencies, more or less, but no doubt it's been extremely challenging. I care deeply about the community and its future. There are parents within the community who, are cur who currently have children in schools and are afraid to speak out. They face the fear of being ostracized or having their children expelled from schools if they speak out. If we won't speak out, who else will? These kids are the future of our city. We desperately need more oversight in these schools. I beg you to do what's right for thousands of Hasidic children in New York whose education is being neglected. Thank you. Thank you. If um, people with numbers six through 10 can come down and the next person is Madeline Vega. Good evening. I've come to PEP meetings since September to speak my mind because I think it's a more sincere way of sharing what I believe instead of Twitter or Facebook. I first started coming because Success Academy needs middle school space. And then I stayed because I was taken in by the rank and file and their fight for the renewal process and how it wasn't working. And then the more meetings I attended, the more evidence there was that the renewal process isn't working. And so I stayed at the February meeting until 2 a.m. rooting for these people because I didn't, I, I was you know, rooting for the panel members who were trying to, to hold off on some of the proposals and table some of the measures. And when I heard that PS25 had, fun, had won its lawsuit to stay open, I was happy for them because it seemed like the only way that you actually could get your school to stop from closing in the city. But now I'm back again because 25 shares space with SA Lafayette. And so those 70 students won't be able to attend school in three weeks when their school is supposed to open 
because of technicality, everyone moves forward when a proposal is made for a closure, everyone moves forward with the applications and saying what school is gonna go into that space. I sat behind new explorers talking about how the other school had come in and started measuring space and they were closed down and the next school took their spot. And now there's no reason, as far as I've been told, that 25 and SA Lafayette couldn't continue to share the space and then take it out later, but I'm here to say if there are emergency measures to be able to help the Lafayette kids, because it's not just those 70 kids, it's the next 70 after them, and soon we'll have 8,000 middle school students looking for space to help start to alleviate that problem now. I implore you to please use your emergency measures. Thank you. Thank you. Lorraine Kavanaugh. Good evening, esteemed member members of the panel. My name is Dr. Lorraine Kavanaugh, and I am a parent from District 19. I live in East New York. Uh, you heard from my daughter Tabitha earlier today, and I'm also here to speak on behalf of IS-292. And our request is that the chancellor come to the school to do an official student count for both 292 and East Brooklyn High School uh, before the school year begins. Now, you've heard a little bit about how important the art program has been to my daughter. You've heard a little bit about how 30% uh, of our students live in transitional housing. But I wanted to take my time here to really try and impress upon you how important IS-292 is in District 19. It is a stellar school from an objective student outcome perspective. They have gifted and talented programs and really are able to, to address the needs of the wide range of abilities of the students that we have in our district. We have 20% of our students have an IEP. 25%, oh, sorry, 25% of our students have an IEP, 20% of our students are English language learners, 30% of our students are in transitional housing, and in addition, the school is still able to offer Regents exams on which the students store, score extraordinarily well. My daughter personally was able to get, what was it, a 96 on the history? 98 on the US history Regents exam. Now, given how strong a performing school IS-292 is, we are still facing losing classrooms and shrinking space. The charter school that we're co-located with, one of them has 12 students per classroom, while we have 35, and 35 plus in certain cases. We beg you, please come to the school, take another look. We deserve to be there. We deserve to serve the community. Thank you. Thank you. Brooke, Brooke Hello, my name is Brooke Suvaki. I'm the parent of a current Success Academy Cobble Hill rising third grader and two more hopefully future Success Academy students. First of all, I wanted to apologize. I feel terrible about what's going on with other co-located schools and that some of the public schools are not getting the access to the space they need. We are in a very similar situation uh, as Success Academy and looking for space. Uh, I didn't know about that, so that's not what I came to talk about, but I do want to apologize for that. But tonight I'm here for two main reasons. One, to offer my support for the recent Success Academy Cobble Hill graduates who are planning to attend SA Lafayette in just a few short weeks. What they and their families have been put through this past several weeks is absolutely unacceptable. Charter schools are public schools. Our school demonstrates exactly what the mayor and you, Mr. Chancellor, are saying we need more of in New York City. High performing schools with a diverse student body. Why are our students being treated as second class citizens? I will once again ask the chancellor to use his emergency powers to allow this school to open as planned and as is desperately needed. Secondly, my son will be heading to middle school in just two short years. I'm highly concerned with how this administration has treated our community, that we continue to find ourselves in this situation. For years, we've been promised a middle school in District 15. I want an answer. I want a commitment in writing that we will have a place for our children to learn. That is so desperately needed. Thank you. Jennifer Robespierre. Thank you. Good evening.
evening panel and Chancellor. Uh, I am a Success Academy parent and I have been for five years. And during those five years, I have marched, I have rallied, I have called in the radio shows, I have attended all of these meetings. And what I have learned is that there were fights that happened almost a decade ago between elected officials, past and present, including our founder, Eva Moskowitz, and the mayor, and Brad Lander, and so many, and so forth, and so on. And what it has led to is for me, as a parent, to constantly fight for my child's school to even exist. This is not something that a parent should have to go through every single year. I have been to 10 events since my child graduated Success Academy Cobble Hill this summer to plead and beg for S.A. Lafayette because that's where he's supposed to go in a couple of weeks and right now he has no school. So I am asking you, Chancellor, you have an opportunity here to be a mediator between City Hall and Success and other charter schools. There, was, there is bad blood, there are grudges, and there is no one that is going to relent. And I need you, all the parents of Success Academy students need you to bring these sides to the table, to work it out, because it is not fair to all these parents and all these students to have to constantly fight for space, fight to exist, and not know what's going to go on year after year. Please be that guiding force for us. Thank you. Thank you. Ralph Gerza. Hello. Thank you, everyone. I want to talk about a couple issues, the budget and um, also PS25. What I see is that all this confusion about the, you know, that for higher school and the budget and do you guys use the school allocation memorandums? My question, I have a whole bunch of questions I know you can't answer but uh, during this time, but there should be a forum where we can ask questions and you answer. Uh, do you use those? Because they should be in open data and they should be in real time in open data. They shouldn't be, uh, the school allocation memorandums right now are 100 PDF files and inside those 100 PDF files are 200 spreadsheets and they're all in different formats, and they're all in different uh, amounts, and it's just a, uh, just a mess. And so I think you should bring Ray Orlando, whose name is all over the place in that, to these meetings, because this is taxpayer money. You on the panel and the chancellor are responsible for $30 billion of New York City money and $8 billion in contracts, and your own, our own New York City comptroller says that the Department of Education's contracts are unauditable. There's a Department of Finance in the Department of Education. New York City has a Department of Finance. It's just amazing how, and I do have a solution. Use the open data yourselves inside of New York City. Right now, you dump open data into the open data websites, but nobody uses it, right? New York City should be using the open data from the open data portal. And also for PS25, I know I only have 10 seconds, I'm, the parent, I'm a parent in that zone and uh, I think it's a giant waste to have an empty building there. Has anyone ever been to that building? The playground is a disaster. And so, thank you. Thank you. Shandy Weitzman. Hi all, thank you for being here and taking time out to sit and listen to us. I'm also here tonight on behalf of Yafed, but I'm also here on behalf of my son. He is 11, he's turning 12 in August, and he recently turned to me and said to me, I'm so jealous, I wish I can do that too. I was telling him about the women in tech program that I'm gonna be doing for a week next week. I'm 31 years old, I will be entering Kingsborough Community College in the fall. My son has never written a book report. He has never had a history class. 
and he is the highest performer in his class of 20 to 25 students. He told me recently, all the boys look to me when they have a spelling question, even in the teacher, when the teacher is there. When I heard that his school was going to get Title I services, I was so excited. Can you imagine the patheticness of that, that I'm excited that my son's school is getting Title I? Why was I excited? Because they don't get anything else. They get 90 minutes, four days a week, not even a full school year, of math, basic math, basic reading. My son will never read Shakespeare unless I open, him up, open it up to him. He knows more about the political field than I will ever, because I'm not interested in that stuff. But he reads, he is brilliant, he is smart, he's articulate. And the only reason that he speaks English, writes English, understands English is because I taught him. I know that there's a lot of noise coming from the community. We don't want it, it's not good for us, it's our right, blah, 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 blah. Don't be fooled, for, fooled by that. It's just a few people making a racket and the parents in the community are afraid to speak up. They are scared of these leaders, of these bullies. They're bullies. My son is being denied an education by a New York City judge in family court. Think about that. Stand for him. Stand for him and stand for the thousands of others. Please help him and help me help him. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Jill Sisner. My name is Jill Seisner. I'm here also on behalf of Success Academy. I'm a parent. I'm a parent of an elementary stu school student at Success Academy Cobble Hill and also a middle school student at Success Academy Bed-Stuy. I can stand here today as a mom, as someone in one of your co New York City communities. I live in District 15 and I can tell you that like you, I just want, like you want for all of the students in New York City, I just want the best for my child. And I can tell you from personal experience how amazing this school system has been for our kids. This safety, safety alone, the safety and the security and the inspiring environment that has been provided to my children is what I, don't, I not only want for them to continue to be able to have, but I want for their classmates as well. And so I'm here because my son's classmates who were promised school space next year in Success Academy Lafayette have now no longer have space. And now these are children who know, have nowhere to go in just a few weeks, who have teachers who might not have a job, who have parents who are probably up at night wondering what are these kids going to do. And so I'm here to ask you because I understand that you can, can find out more and you can help. So please, I will happily host a tour for you. I will show you the school. I will show you firsthand how joyful this community is. But I will also ask you to read the data because I think of myself in my, pro my profession. I study data all, all day. I make informed decisions based on analytics. Look at how well Success Academy is doing. I could tell you this from an emotional place, but I could also tell it to you from a statistical place. Please help us with Success Academy Lafayette. These kids, they need a place to continue to grow and thrive. Thank you. Thank you. Jennifer Holmes. Okay. Good evening, panel. My name is Jennifer Holmes. I'm a parent of two happy Success Academy children, one who was ready to go to uh, Success Academy Lafayette in three weeks. She's all ready for orientation. She doesn't have a place to go. We are 70 families that are all part of a dynamic, diverse community. I know you've been in our schools. I know you appreciate what we stand for. And I know that you want these diverse schools to be open in this city. The building that they're slated to move into will be empty if Success Academy's not there. I know that when we... <laughs> 
don't worry what? about the clock. <laughs> we're okay, but I think we're fine. I think, okay, if it doesn't, oh. But the beeping is a little. <laughs> I can't focus. doing uh, work on the roof and they tripped a wire so that explains the fire alarm yes so there is just roof is something work has been doing on the roof they tripped an alarm upstairs um, but that's everything is safe we're okay hopefully the chirping will stop that's I'm okay with the flashing lights oh. Thank you. Oh, maybe. Go ahead. Okay, I'll give it a go. Yes. Um, I was at a town hall here in June on above and beyond the phone calls, the petitions. My children have attended meetings with uh, elected officials with me. And you mentioned that there were 2,000 available seats for Success Academy scholars this upcoming fall. But the truth is we have 12,000 Brooklyn children who are going to need space within the next few years. If PS25 is in that building in a small space, which they may not be, and Success Academy Middle School cannot take over the space that they have already claimed, the school will be empty. And it is a large, empty building. It just, I don't understand where the sense is, and I hope that you can make it right for us this evening. Thank you. Thank you. All right. So thank you everyone for your comments. Um, I'm just looking if the panel members have any questions or comments at this moment do not so the next regular meeting of the panel for educational policy will be held on wednesday august 22nd 2018 at ms 131 in manhattan so this meeting is now adjourned thank you everyone. please get home safely <laughs>